Hi everyone, my name is Liz Leakey. I'm um, part of the user experience and design team at BBC along with Leanne. Um, I'm creative director for BBC Children, so overseeing all the design for CBBS and CBBC. Uh, can I ask in the room how many people remember watching children's TV as a, a kid? And how many of you are, are now parents to children and watch children's TV, whether you like it or not? <laughs> okay, so that means all of you either remember being a child or have a very, very recent reminder of what it's like to be around children. So hopefully you're following on from Leanne's talk, you'll have an appreciation of the audience today. Um, UX and D at the BBC is a team of about 120 people, um, spread across 10 products. Um, but within children's ourselves, we have a team of eight um, UX and D designers. Um, but we also work as part of a much bigger team with editorial and product colleagues and marketing audience. So we're actually part of a big team of over 100 people. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is some of the work that we've been doing um, over the last couple of months and also the processes we've used. So we're quite process heavy from BBC, so hopefully it's uh, interesting. Um, the work we've been doing alongside the apps work is around responsive, so we've been moving CBBC and CBBC's websites onto a responsive code base where they're actually sharing the same code, the same components, um, whereas before we had two very bespoke sites that we had to maintain separately. So that's quite a big sort of shift for us. Um, using Scala in the cloud, so it's a big sort of move forward in terms of how we manage the site. Um, but when I joined, we were in the thick of it, sort of 18 month project, and the very last page we were going to get to was the home page, so it felt like there was an opportunity there to um, sort of look at what a home page could be for children, especially when you think about the fact that it's not necessarily always relevant, like children need deep link in or they search, they don't necessarily go to the home page, so how would you make the home page a destination in its own right? Why would you? We even had conversations like, do we even need a home page? So obviously we decided we did, and um, then we're on to start doing some work around it. Unlike the work that Leanne showed you though, it was very unclear and kind of foggy in terms of what, how we want to approach this, what we want to get out of it. So it's slightly blue sky, but also we had to build something quite quickly for launch. Um, so in true sort of group cross-discipline style, we had a workshop, and, uh, which involved a lot of post-it notes, which most of our workshops do. And we, we were there basically to identify themes, so looking at the strategy for how we wanted to approach the homepage, what we wanted to use it for. And the four themes we identified were content discovery, reflecting the channel, social and mobile first. And our plan was basically to, to use the um, design sprint process that Google have kind of pioneered. So have a sprint on each of those four themes over four weeks. It's quite a rapid kind of uh, opportunity to explore ideas really. Um, so for content discovery, what we, what we looked at was um, how we might allow the users to discover new content. So we had like you know, hundreds and hundreds of pieces of content, yet we know that children weren't necessarily finding all the things on the site, so it's good how do we enable them to move around more easily. Uh, reflecting the channel, so if you watch CBBS or CBBC, particularly CBBC, it's, it's quite, it's, it, the channel's quite anarchic and playful and funny, yet the website kind of felt quite flat and didn't really reflect some of the values of the channel, so we, we felt there was an opportunity there to look at how you could be more playful with the homepage. Social, this is probably one of the most difficult ones for us. We're not going to recreate WhatsApp, Snapchat, <laughs> Facebook. Um, but we also know that for that young age group, they do want to connect, they do want to have a social experience. And if you come to the homepage at the moment, or back when we started this work, it's quite a lonely place. There's no evidence that there are any other children. You don't get a sense that there's a community or there's mm. all these you know, million users coming online. So we wanted to make it feel less lonely. And then mobile first. We often talk about mobile first, especially now that we're in a responsive world. But we often still start, apart from with apps, we often still start with desktop sketches and desktop views. And then mobile ends up just being a sort of smaller screen size of what you did for desktop, rather than thinking, actually, if you're on the go, what could you do for children when they're out and about on the go, perhaps with low um, connection, low bandwidth. So those are the four themes you identified. And then um, the process we wanted to use was a design sprint methodology. Um, also known as sort of lean sprints or design cycles. Do any of you use design sprints as part of your practice? If you, do the rest of you know what they are? At all? I, don't, I don't want to teach uh, grandmothers to suck up, so. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Um, I'll just jump out of this quickly and just take you into. Um, where's my mouse gone? So 
how, how these work is basically a five day, very rapid process. Day one, you spend time looking at the understand phase, so it's understanding the problem space. Day two is my favourite day, which is coming up with lots of ideas, generating lots of um, thinking, kind of blue sky, deferring all judgment. And then day three is decide where you get your stakeholders involved and actually try and whittle those ideas down into something you might want to build. Day four is prototyping. And then day five is actually putting stuff in front of users and getting feedback. So it's quite a full on experience. Doing four back to back, four weeks back to back was fairly exhausting. But um, the amount we generated in those four weeks was quite phenomenal compared to some of the ways we work and much slower pace and other things. Um, I won't go through the whole of that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was that we um, also have a set of personas that we use. So rather than this just being based on our thinking, we're generally a bunch of white middle class people who are all very media savvy. So it's, as, as Leanne said, it's really important that we put ourselves in the shoes of the audience and think about it from a child's point of view. So last year we spent some time putting the personas together for the five of our kind of age groups. Um, so we have Charlie, and then we have a breakdown of some of his expected behaviour, motivation, things he likes to do, devices he uses. Uh, we have Ella, who's five. Uh, Olivia, seven. Um, I think Jay's going to upload some of these uh, PowerPoints and keynotes afterwards so you can look at these in more detail. Ben, who's nine. And then we also have Zoe, who's 11. So that gives us a kind of full uh, breadth of the age range that we cater for. So it's such a big demographic. It's, we almost would say that each year has a different um, need or motivation or behaviour because every year as a child you just change so much with the year. So. Um, so what we find they're good for is, yes, getting lots of ideas quickly and being able to test them really fast, focusing on the stakeholders and the core team so that they can actually just really focus on the problem. So it's really good to actually go in a separate room and talk, you know, work for a week away from your desk, away from your email and just kind of like cocoon yourselves and immerse yourself in this. Um, we also find it really useful for bringing together the different disciplines. So we have a whole editorial team, a whole product team, a whole UX team, a technical team. And it's easy for us to end up being quite siloed or having different agendas. So this one actually just literally forces you to come together and focus on one thing and work together. Um, Where's past those ones? We've talked about that. So um, we use Pinterest to capture some of the work we're doing because obviously every day we're just generating hundreds of post-it notes, flip chart pieces of paper, sketches. So as a way of capturing it and being able to give visibility to the stakeholders, we spent a lot of time getting everything up on Pinterest um, and it was a really nice way to be able to look back and see all the work we've done and obviously if we hadn't picked up an idea earlier in the week we'd be able to go back and revisit it. So yeah, Pinterest was really handy. Um, and then, the, the, so on the ideas day you're basically doing a lot of sketching, a lot of ideation, um, lots of very rough drawings, lots of thinking on the fly and coming up with pretty rough ideas but with jam packed with kind of nice little nuggets that we could then take forward into prototyping. Um, these are just a, a selection of things that came up. So we had some rather crazy ideas. Um, I should say actually we work with an agency called Complete Control based in Bath. So we actually did the sprints down in Bath in their amazing, beautiful landscape of the rolling hills of Bath, which is amazing. Um, and they obviously all brought their ideas. They do a lot of work with children, but not being BBC, they had some fresh perspectives on things, which was brilliant. And actually, this is one of their ideas, was this idea of Hacker, who's one of the characters of CBC. He's very into to meet pace, so we were looking at this idea of a collaborative project that would bring children to come to the website all on the same day to do something. And this was building basically a big sandwich um, that builds and builds and builds over time. Um, Hacker has this kind of silly uh, uh, catchphrase, calling everybody Cocker. So um, the call to action was around you know, filling it with meat, with meat paste, with veg. And then by the end of the day, the idea is that you know, children would have contributed to this giant, ridiculous sandwich. So it's kind of a bit silly and playful. It wasn't meant to be anything you know, that would stay up for very long, which is something quite fun. Um, we also have, were aware that when we were looking at social, that for the CBB's age, the idea of virtual friends is quite difficult because they're very much based in the real world. 
people around them, the idea that there are children online doing stuff is a little bit hard for them to grasp. So rather than saying who, you know, which virtual friends do you want to play with or connect with your real friends, it was we tried to tie it into basing it on your favourite characters and your brands because that's what they come to see these for. Um, we looked at ideas around sort of threads, around latest, live, um, <laughs> being able to use live data around how many children were doing things at any one time so that you could really reflect back to them activity. So rather than it being about chatting or about posting things, it was just us showing like the masses of children doing things at any moment. So from all of that, we managed then to go to prototypes. I haven't actually got any working prototypes with me because they're all on individual devices, which are back at base being used for other things. But this will just give you a flavour of some of the things we worked up. So this one was reflecting the time of day so that um, when the channel changes, the channel where it does a really good job of reflecting the time of day change. So we wanted to do that better on the website. So as it gets dark, it starts to actually um, get dark and <laughs> stars. Um, we wanted to think about whether we could use talent and the presenters more, so um, this idea of the presenters kind of sponsoring content, <coughs> that didn't test very well at all. It turns out that actually they're not that interested in the presenters, they're interested <laughs> in the characters and the brands, so um, quite a few of the children didn't actually know who she was, which was disappointing, obviously. So. <laughs> yeah. Good insights came out of this, as you can see. Um, we, we also wanted to get this idea around sort of urgency or being part of something that's happening now, like the idea of anticipation around the countdown, um, which again had mixed, I think for, for big brands, children are really waiting for it, but I think they got confused with the idea of catch up and watching stuff live on iPlayer, that they see it very much as a catch up experience rather than somewhere where you watch something live. Um, same thing with the presenters on this one. Although the, the big do not press button was very popular. <laughs> no surprises there. <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> um, and then we had this idea around content discovery for, ch for young children, where we wanted to kind of play with this idea of a wheel, but rather than giving you all the brands, it's about your favourite brands. So this idea that you could give you some, uh, some of the sort of gold brands that we want the children to come across that we care about. Then the idea that parents could also go in and actually select the brands that they know their children like and swap those into the wheel so that you can customise it for their brands. And then the wheel would actually change to be the things that <coughs> your child likes. And that this would spin around and uh, become a navigation tool. This is one that we probably will take forward at some point and do further work on because it did test really well and parents and children responded really well to it. I think they liked the fact that it wasn't too overwhelming in terms of the amount of content and it was clear to use. So. Um, and this is another idea we're looking forward to. At the moment, CBBC and CBBS are two separate experiences and we kind of go, right, you're six, you're cut off from CBBS and now you have to go over here. And we don't really reflect the fact that children age and mature at different ages and some still like CBBS content and some are ready for CBBC. And actually they're kind of brother and sister, so why don't we actually make more of linking the two? So this was an idea of, <coughs> on CBeebies, put a panel basically saying, are you ready to try CBBC? Sort of letting them know that it exists. And then if you're on um, CBBC, perhaps, you know, you're tired and you've got in from school, perhaps you just want to watch a bit of CBeebies. You might not admit it to your friends, but you might just want to watch something like a comfort watch or something you're used to, nostalgia. Um, or you might have younger siblings, so you watch it anyway. So it's just letting them see that there's actually, you know, two things here. Um, this was another social one which was looking at how we could, um, almost like tag clouds, but more with numbers, just reflecting the things that are popular right now by the size of the boxes. The numbers, the children had no idea what the numbers were about, it was too, they just didn't understand the numbering. Um, and they didn't actually notice that the boxes were different sizes, and they just thought it was an interesting layout, they didn't actually realise that it had some relevance to the popularity. Um, so that was, again, useful to know. Um, and then this one was going back to the Friends one, which was talking about um, who do you want to play with today? So very much giving them their brands to choose from rather than real friends or virtual friends. And then the final one, which was quite interesting, was uh, looking at this idea of being able to comment and join in with a live episode so that your comments are coming up. So rather than sitting there on your phone texting your friends or sending messages over your phone, it was, you could actually publish those in real time so you can actually join in and feel like you're part of something that's got a buzz around it, especially if it's like a really big episode or the end of a series where something's going to happen. 
and then you build into your comments. This one is a really popular idea, but it involves a lot of moderation, um, and therefore it's a big overhead in terms of actually being able to do it for real on a regular basis. But it was definitely popular with the kids in terms of being able to see their comment appear. Um, sorry, that wasn't the final one, this one was. So, like the rest of the internet, we're also looking at cards in terms of how we um, make these kind of snackable, shareable pieces of content. Uh, so we were looking at this one uh, that would fill in a duck, which would flip over and then give you basically three more pieces of content to go and explore. So not so much on the sharing, but more about content discovery and using the mechanism of a card as a sort of interactive thing that you get in own life. So the things we, we learned about um, were, it was the first time we'd done design sprints and they were really successful, it was really hard work. But the location in Bath was a real issue because it was three and a half hours on the train from Manchester. So literally all of us had to camp down in Bath for a week, which for people with families and you know, wanted to do a bit of their day job, it just meant it was a really long way and a big commitment to make. Um, so we had a lot of people sort of going back home on Wednesday because they could only come for two days, which meant to be kind of by the end of the week you only had a, a small set of people left. And then by the end of the week, when the others saw the work we'd done, it was kind of like, oh, it's changed so much since we left. Like, it's hardly recognisable, kind of what we done while we were away. So ideally, you'd have more people there for the whole sprint, so you didn't get that sense of, oh, you, you've ruined my idea while I've been out here. <laughs> <laughs> or you've changed it unrecognisably. Um, and the same issue was around stakeholder visibility. So we had some various points where we really wanted stakeholders to be able to come and look at the work we were doing and have visibility. The only way they could do that was us sending them a PDF, getting them in a room in Salford at Media City, sticking stuff on the wall and doing a telephone conference with them. And it just, it just didn't give you the sense that it would if you were all in the same room looking at stuff on the wall. So um, that was quite challenging, I think. They didn't really feel as involved as we would have liked. Um, commitment again, just my first point, just trying to get people to sign up for four weeks solidly. Most people have day jobs, they have other things they have to do, so the idea that you can just block out four weeks to come to this is probably unrealistic. So each week we had different people from different teams, which meant we kind of didn't have any continuity, so it would have been nice to have had a few dedicated people that could have been representing the different disciplines. I mean, that, that comes down to my last point, which is just planning. Um, I think if you plan this like months in advance, you probably allow for those people to be free, but planning it a month ahead, it's, it's too difficult. Um, this is a big one. The prototypes we built were very shiny and looked lovely, but some of the interaction wasn't as hot as it could have been. And actually, what you want to test in those testing sessions is the interaction, because it's all about, does this thing work? Do they get it? Do they want to play with it? Do they want to discover, share? Um, and instead we had quite a lot of very nice looking things, but often they were just JPEGs that were flat or only one or two things were clickable. So when we were giving things to children on iPads and going, okay, see what you can do, most of it didn't work, so we just kind of hit brick walls immediately. Um, so I think just spending more time on the prototype and making sure that you're really clear about what you want to get out of it and being sure that you're not going to kind of undermine your own testing basically by giving them a prototype that's a bit too half-baked. Um, part of the reason we also had prototypes that probably weren't as good as they could have been is we tried to do too many. So the bit where you do your, your converge on all those ideas, we found it very difficult to throw away a lot of ideas. So we tried to build four instead of one. So we ended up with four lovely prototypes each week. But instead of having one that did everything, we had four that were kind of like, well, this bit works and that bit works, and that bit doesn't quite. So we were just too ambitious and not hard enough on ourselves. We should have just been more ruthless and said, just do one and do it well. Um, and then the, having backup kids, so the testing, <coughs> for some reason every week one or two children would drop out and because we only had six or seven and two drop out, that really gives you quite low numbers to actually make a call on. If you've got three out of five children doing something, you can't really say for sure that that's, you know, that you can be solid about the decision you're making there. So I think having some backup kids or just recruiting more on the basis that one or two might drop out would be the thing we'd do. Um, and then finally planning just plan, plan, plan. It's, uh, there's a lot more to it than it looks on paper. Google's nice guide of how to do it is lovely, but there's actually a lot more you need to do around the edges in terms of preparation, getting your capacitor analysis, getting stakeholder interviews lined up, getting all stakeholders available for when you want to kind of show them ideas. So logistically, you always need like, a project manager to run these things. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a really useful way of working, and we learned a lot. And like I say, we actually came out of it with about 16 prototypes after four weeks, which 
it's a lot more than we probably would have produced if we'd have worked in a more traditional way. So um, it was definitely an exciting way to, to work. But since then, we've started using them, doing one per month, just doing a week per month in this kind of intensive way. And we're using it to look at tagging, to look at trending, and to look at MyBBC and personalisation. So we're continuing to, to do these. Um, I've actually just come from an ideation day today in Manchester, so <laughs> <laughs> I missed the second half, but yeah, that's it. <laughs>